him this morning, you may be surprised to find out that the man who wrote that, of course, is Stuart Hamlin. If you go back and study, uh, he was an old drunk cowboy out in California and uh, going to a tent meeting out there a couple times, and uh, God saved him. And so he was a radio... um, He was on the radio several times, of course, singing and everything. And believe it or not... There was another old cowboy named John Wayne that saw him one day and he said, Stuart, I heard you, I think he said, found religion or found Jesus or something. And uh, and he had quit drinking, he had started living right. And um, he looked back at him, he said, it's no secret. And Stuart Hamlin went home and sat down and actually wrote this song, wrote the words to this song. And uh, it is no secret what God can do. God can take an old drunk and sober him up, change his life, and live a life that's honoring and glorifying to the Lord. Amen? I'm not going to ask how many of y'all know that to be true. Because I don't want <laughs> There might be some hands that go up that uh, I'd say, really? <laughs> I wouldn't have known that. Brother Nick, I'm glad you're back. Feeling good? I'm not going to say looking good because that might be taken the wrong way. But uh, Rebecca thinks you are, so that's okay. Why don't you lift your voice, open us in a word of prayer tonight. Lord, I thank God for tonight. Thank God for each and every person here. Uh, I pray you uh, move mightily through the preacher tonight and uh, have us all get something that will help us uh, in our um, upcoming endeavors here. pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. And, uh, of course, we are praying towards uh, this weekend. And all that God has for us, starting with simple steps. Uh, Tomorrow night, meal starts at 645. And uh, then, of course, be praying through Saturday. Um, I'm actually opening in prayer down at the GOP convention that they're having to adopt their platform for this year. And I said, we got a platform. I like it pretty good. And uh, But their platform. And uh, so I'll be opening in prayer. So do pray for that. There are several of them praying that, that the wording and everything of standing strong for life and, um, and those things would just stay exactly as they are. And so we had a good Bible study down at the Capitol today. And uh, 30 representatives came out. And uh, good prayer time and uh, good devotion time. And so we were thankful for that. And uh, thank you for praying as Miss Crystal and I made the quick trip out to Tucson and back. And uh, God opened that door and be able to speak. There's about 50 pastors there and uh, plus some political consultants and uh, some activists and some other um, non-profits that were there. So God really worked uh, throughout that time. And I had one man come up to me. He works with um, Super PACs. That, you know, get all this money and spend it all, and that's how you got seven flyers a day for Nikki Haley uh, in your mailbox, okay? He works with super PACs like that, and uh, he come up to me after I spoke, and he says, Concord, New Hampshire? And I said, yeah. He said, I'm from Bow, and he's living in, in South Carolina now. He said, I still I, I bought our family home up there, still got a home in Bow. My mom still lives up there. I'm up there two or three times. He said, I probably got 30 first cousins, he said, that live in the Pentecook Concord Bow area. And I said, well, our church is right over on Sheep Davis. He said, I know. He said, I've already looked up where it is. He said, I'll be there when I come in town. And uh, so I said, how is that? I said, you fly all the way out there, and a man comes up to you that's from your hometown. And I said, he's got probably 50 of his relatives. 
relatives live in, within 10 miles of where we're sitting right now. And uh, I said, maybe God will just open the door and start seeing some of them saved. I don't think they're all saved. Some live on my street down on the other end of the road. And uh, so just what God's doing, I see you never would have never would have thought through all of that. And uh, so I'm, I'm so thankful for it. And uh, I know several got to see the eclipse up here. I, I saw it about 30, 35% uh, down in Tucson. And uh, Brother Jordan uh, shared a thought today, just shared it on social media. He said, I'll leave it right here. One of the most Googled things during the eclipse and shortly after no why are my eyes hurting <laughs> seriously that was one of the most googled things about why they're out there looking at the sun without glasses and wondering why their eyes are hurting and i said oh that must have been southerners that were doing that i'm just kidding and uh but i said you're looking up at the sun without glasses and they're wondering why their eyes are hurting and uh i said i don't i don't get it so i think that's all we're gonna sing tonight and uh so we'll get ready pray for this weekend um i just got off the phone with brother parsons pastor barry parsons uh, about a little over an hour ago they're coming in on saturday and uh, he'll be preaching for us all day on sunday school in uh, sunday school morning service afternoon service I said, this is revival meeting for our church. I said, so whatever God has on your heart, I said, to stir our church up. And then pastors coming in and preachers on Monday, Monday night, 630 right here. And uh, Tuesday all day with sessions in the morning, afternoon, and in the evening. And uh, Pastor Mike Norris and Pastor Tim Rabin be flying in on Monday and uh, preaching for us Monday night and Tuesday night. And uh, Brother Mike Norris, he texts me. He said, I called Matthew Frank and because we were doing, he's smoking some pork for Tuesday lunch. He said, I called Matthew Frank, and he said, I'm bringing up some extra money, he said, to have brisket for lunch on Tuesday. And so we've got, we've got brisket now. We got it all set up. Brother Tom picked it up down at the butcher's, and uh, so we're going to have brisket. And I said, because I wasn't buying brisket. I'm not putting that money into it. And uh, so we got two big briskets and some smoked pork and everything for lunch on Tuesday. Pastor Tim Rabin's bringing his wife in with him. She'll be speaking to the ladies on Tuesday morning. And uh, activities for the teenagers, for the juniors, and nursery all around. And uh, we're looking forward to all of that. Well, before we get Brother Shaver up here and uh, the family, the missionaries to Iceland, and I found this out a few years ago that actually Greenland has more ice than Iceland, and Iceland is more green than Greenland. So... Yeah, so say that 10 times fast and try to explain it and uh, through all of that. But we have a memory verse. I've given you two weeks to be able to learn your memory verse. And it's not the one that's on your prayer sheet tonight, so you can't use that as a cheat sheet. And uh, we changed that. But uh, Luke 23, 43, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And so if you remember that from two weeks ago, and uh, the seven sayings on the cross, right before Resurrection Sunday. And so first question is, who was he speaking to when he said, uh, Today thou sh shalt thou be with me in paradise? Who was he talking to? The thief on the cross beside him. And uh, the Hardwicks were sitting right down here this morning in our morning service, and uh, uh, Judy Hardwick, uh, and she, she put her hand up. I said, who? And she said, the thief on the cross beside him. I said, you just pointed at your husband. And uh, so, she, she hurried up. so, all right, let's start over here. Teenagers are staying up here and uh, to be able to hear Brother Shaver tonight. And so who's got their memory verse? Who wants to go first? Go ahead. Three forty-three, and Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. All right, got it. Luke twenty-three forty-three, and Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. All right, wonderful. Who we got? Go ahead. Luke twenty-three forty-three, and Jesus said unto him, uh, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Wonderful. All right, we're going. We're going. All right, Brother Peter. Luke 23, 43. And Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, 
day thou shalt pay, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. All right, let's jump over to this side. Who's got it over here? Go ahead, Melissa. Luke 23, 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Verily, I say unto thee. <laughs> you got all the words in there. Yeah. Do you have your hand up? I did. Go ahead. And Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. All right, wonderful. Who else? Coming back through this side. Brother Ollie, go ahead. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Isn't that today a wonderful thing? Now, wouldn't it be a blessing if Jesus said that again today and the rapture took place? <laughs> today! Let's all go. Let's all go. So, all right. Anybody else? Go ahead, Vicki. <laughs> Luke 23, 43, and Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Got it. Wonderful job. Wonderful. Anybody else back through here? Go ahead, Jody. Luke 23, 43, and Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Got it. All right. Anybody else on this side? All right. Go ahead, Ruth. And Jesus said unto All right, wonderful. Anybody else? Careful, don't put your hand up like this. I'll, I'll, be, <laughs> I'll be calling on you. All right, anyone else? Great job on your memory verse. We have this new one uh, for this week, and uh, I actually spoke on this in our morning service today, and uh, it's Psalm 145.4. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. And uh, so that's our memory verse. It will not be next week with the revival meeting. We will not have Thursday services next week. And so I'm giving you two weeks to be able to learn this memory verse. Psalm 145, 4. One generation shall praise thy works. I gave a, a Bible study this, this morning about... Um, how that we ought to be seeing, experiencing, and proclaiming uh, the works of God in our lives to the next generation. Amen. And uh, make sure that we're handing that down. And so we're thankful for that. And uh, so what's well, great to have the Shaver family here with us. And uh, Brother Michael and Miss Rachel and the kids are downstairs. They were excited to be able to go down to Patch Club. And uh, so another church, they were in their home church, does Master's Club and so one of the boys had his master's club folder just in case we did master's club but he pulled out a patch the pirate sheet from another church he said but i've got this one we can go down is that what he said back there and so we're thankful for that and uh so we've been in touch with brother shaver if you remember um there with all points baptist mission we had uh dr robbie morrison uh that was here with us back in september he's the director of that mission agency and so we're thankful and so brother shaver you come on up i told you you'd have about 45 minutes we're doing it quick it's right at 6 45 now and uh we're thankful you come on up welcome to granite state baptist church and uh so thankful you and your family give a testimony watch videos whatever you want to do thank okay you thank you so much you, pastor well it's good to be here with you tonight um uh, thank you for having us in. This is a blessing. Thursday is uh, not something we get to usually schedule, so it's nice to uh, be able to have a meeting on a, a Thursday. We were in Connecticut last night in a meeting. We were over in uh, Erie before that. We were in, we've been all over the Northeast for a while, and this is one of our last meetings up in the Northeast. We'll head down to the D.C. area for about a month, and then we'll be in Ohio for about a month. But we're grateful to be here with you tonight. Um, I'd like to introduce my wife. This is Rachel. And then we have five children. They're all downstairs. Jaden, Deacon, Colton, Adeline, and Aylin. Jaden will turn 12 in about 25 days. And Aylin is four. So they're all in between those ages. But we've been on the road for a little while now, and we're grateful to see what God is doing. God has called us to Iceland, and we have a short video that will just kind of introduce our family and our burden for Iceland, and then I'll get up afterwards and say a few things about Iceland, and uh, maybe open it up for a few questions. If anyone has any questions, I'd love to answer them. So if you think of something, hold on to it, and I'll answer it after the video. Go ahead, brother. Thank you. My name is Michael Shaver, and God has called 
my family and I to be missionaries in Iceland. As a child, um, I went to a church and it was very missions minded. That's really where God began to uh, initiate a desire for missions and a love for missions. I even surrendered to missions at that time. Looking back, I don't think I was fully called, but I do think God was preparing me. So I graduated college shortly after I married my wife and we were faithful in ministries and God began to burden me again for missions through several messages that the pastor had preached. And I began seeking God's face. Okay, Lord, what is it that you have for me? What are you trying to tell me? It took me about six months, but I realized God was moving us into missions. So my cousin Nate, was called to missions and he surrendered to Iceland and during that time I didn't know he was praying about it but I had kind of heard he was praying about it and that's around the time when God began to put missions on my heart as well. We began talking about missions and I told him God's put on my heart to work with you in Iceland. He said I've been praying for a partner Michael. When we go to Iceland, our burden is to plant churches. We want to see people saved. We want to disciple them. We want to build a biblical church. Iceland is considered to be more developed than the United States is. They have uh, a lot more things accessible to every person in Iceland than say the United States would. But I think because of that, it has hardened their heart. And so they walk around thinking that they're fine and in truth, they need the gospel. I'm not 100% sure if God is sending me there to see great revival, although I hope so. And I fully believe that he is, and I expect him to do so. Whether or not that happens, he has called us to reveal who he is to these people. And he has not forsaken the islands and the far reaching places of the world. And I believe that's where he wants us to go. My family is just as much a part of this call as I am, and I fully expect God to use them over there as well. I know that each person in my family has been uniquely gifted by God to do something for him. I'm excited to see what things God is going to use them to do just as much as I'm excited to see what God's going to use me for. When I come to the end of serving God in Iceland or wherever it is that he has for me, when I come to the end of that, I want people to know that I was faithful to the Lord through the whole time and I would want to stand before God and for him to be pleased with what I've done. Even though it's a hard field, I know that God is going to unite our family and bring us through to bring glory to him and the gospel to the people of Iceland. All right, so Iceland is a little island in the North Atlantic. There's about 450,000 people on the island. The island's about the size of the state of Kentucky. And um, they are about 99% atheist. Uh, if you go online, it's going to say that they're about 65% Lutheran. But all that means is that they are enrolled in the Lutheran church. Um, the, the priests of the Lutheran church over there are atheists. They don't believe in God. It's just a very cultural thing for them and it has nothing to do with what they believe. Uh, they're Vikings by heritage and they have kind of kept this coldness towards religion that the Vikings had and it's stayed with them for the last 1200 years. But that's who we believe God has uh, burdened us to go reach. So if anybody has any questions about Iceland or the people or our family or deputation, anything like that, I'd love to answer any questions that anybody may have uh, at this time. Yes, sir. So there's one missionary who's been in Iceland for 25 years. Another missionary has just joined him about eight months ago. Um, the missionary who's been there in 25 years, he said that he's seen 17 different missionaries come and leave while he's been there. He said some of them left for fair reasons. He said, but a great number of them left saying this place is too hard and these people won't receive the gospel. Mm -hmm. So it is a hard work that we know we're entering into. Uh, he will be down in the capital city of Reykjavik. That's where the current missionary is. We'll be there to learn the language, but we would like to go up to the a northern city called Akureyri and start a, a church up there. It's about a six-hour drive from the capital city to the city that we're looking to go to. Good question. Yes, sir. Is the population concentrated around Reykjavik, or is there more of a spread out across the island? So... If given a long period of time, I'll have a slideshow that I do, and there's this amazing picture on there, and um, you'll see that almost it's a colored picture of population density, 
and down near the capital city of Reykjavik, it's red. And then up in this uh, town of Ocuary, it's yellow, and almost the rest of the map is green because nobody lives there. <laughs> yeah, so about two thirds of the population does live in the little peninsula near the capital city. And then the other third of the population is spread out around the coastline. But we're talking villages of about a thousand people or less, most of them. Some of them down even to less than a hundred people in these little villages around the coastline. Ocuary has about 40,000 people in its area, the, the city and then a few of the small towns close by. So yes, good question. Yes, sir. They have a socialistic democracy. Um, we will have freedom of religion over there. I could go over there. I could pull out a stool, stand up on it, and street preach if I wanted to. Their interest in the gospel is zero, so the chances of it having any effect are very, very small. Um, uh, relationship building is going to be a much higher priority for us over there. Um, but because of the socialism, it's, it's not... It's not pure socialism, but it is, it is definitely socialistic. There's social medicine and there's social other things and certain business things. There's rules on them, keeping them from all sorts of things. So it's, a, it's an interesting government uh, over there. Uh, I thought, yes, ma'am. Do they have seasons like we have here? Um, so typically I'll say there's two seasons over there. There's... Uh, cold and wet and windy and rainy and then there's cold and wet and windy and snowy <laughs> so that's basically the two seasons they have the average summer temperature is 55 degrees um, but the average winter temperature is 33 degrees it's not as cold as you might think it would be um, but it does snow uh, the wind can range from 25 miles an hour to 125 miles an hour and it's always windy there. So they'll, snowstorms will just sweep in out of nowhere, uh, but then they'll be gone in two days. Uh, there's a warm water current that surrounds the whole island, and that's really the number one reason why it doesn't get colder there. But they do get Arctic winds, and it's, I would never tell someone it's not cold, because it is cold, but it's not the pure temperature as much as it is the wind chill that'll really get you. Good question. Yes? heavy bent toward atheism in the population, do you expect your ministry will need to focus on apologetics? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure that they put as much of a premium on the facts to have to steer it towards apologetics as much, but I do think apologetics will need to be there as we teach because we will have to start with, I mean, very basic stuff with them um, at Adam and Eve creation we will have to go through that so apologetics will be there but I don't think it's going to be as much in an in a debate format as much as it is just you, you need to understand that there is a God and he's created man and that makes him the ruler and the one who makes the rules but uh, that is a good question we will have to deal a lot in apologetic type subjects I don't know how deep we'll have to get into the arguments of it, though. Good question. Did anybody else have a question? Yes, ma'am. For a language, you, you had mentioned, I think you did, that you would have to learn. Yes. So they have a They have their own language. It's called Icelandic. It, so Iceland was settled around 750 AD by Norwegians. And so the language they have is like an ancient Norwegian. Icelandic is closer to ancient Norwegian than modern day Norwegian is. Um, it's so much so that I've heard that some of the other Scandinavian countries make fun of the Icelandic language because it sounds weird to them because it's so old. Uh, so they'll make fun of it. It's considered to, the United States will class, uh, the army, the military will classify languages into four categories, one, two, three, and four. On difficulty to learn, something like Spanish might be a, in a category one, something like Mandarin might be a four. Uh, Icelandic is considered a level four language. So it will be a hard language to learn. Yes. Yes, sir. I'm not sure how to answer that question. They're not considered poor, but that doesn't mean they have a lot of money. Icelandic is about the fifth highest cost of living country in the world. Very expensive. Uh, for my family to live in, for my family to live in something larger than a 
a two bedroom apartment over there, it's gonna cost us $4,500 a month. Um, that being said, just because the, they, the money's there doesn't mean that they have a lot of stuff. So what they have is typically nice modern things, they just don't have very much of it. Um, there's a, uh, uh, another example, there's a young lady in the church over there and she rents half of somebody's garage and she pays $1,250 a month for it. Uh, and that's where she lives. So it's, I'm not gonna say they don't have money, but their money is very much spent on necessities. Um, and they, they have all the modern conveniences we do, but they're, they run through their money faster just because things are expensive. So I'm not exactly sure how to answer the question on poverty. Homelessness, as far as I know, isn't really an issue. Well, it, homelessness isn't a terrible issue over there, but they are in a housing crisis right now. But you, you would die if you didn't find shelter. It is cold enough that everyone who didn't find shelter would die. They bring all the sheep and all the horses in for the winter because it does get cold enough to kill them. Uh, so people find, they find housing, but it's becoming an issue over there, which is one of the reasons the prices are high, and then tourism is also spiking the prices because people will buy houses and instead of renting them, they will put them up for Airbnb, unless they can rent them for what they can make putting them up for Airbnb. So that's, that's a good question. Anybody else? Yes, sir. What about the volcanic activity on the island? There's 120 active volcanoes on the island, or close to 120. There's one currently about 10 miles from the airport, and basically it's just a giant crack in the ground, and it is putting out lava about once a month for several days. Once a month, it's just releasing pressure and pouring lava out over there. Um, volcanoes are a, a, they're a way of life over there. Um, they have good systems uh, finding them, so there's not usually, nobody usually dies from them, but this last volcano in that area, it destroyed a whole town. About 2,000 homes were destroyed because of the volcano. So it is something that happens. Yes, yes sir. About the uh, gem of, uh, the uh, gem, what am I thinking? Gem, gem of the heat in the, in the ground there. They have thermal. geothermal energy over there. Um, so it's interesting, the water, they will pump the water from under the ground and the water will be boiling hot and they have to send it to a cooling station before they send it into houses over there. Um, they operate much of their electric grid off of the geothermal energy over there. I was mentioning earlier that per capita, Iceland uses almost three times as much uh, electricity per person than Americans do. Um, just because it's so cheap over there. Yeah, they do a lot of geothermal stuff. Because of that, there's a lot of hot springs all over the places too, which is another one of the tourist attractions. There's volcanoes, hot springs, beautiful mountains, ice caves, glaciers, and on this little island, there's over 10,000 waterfalls. So if you like nature and beauty, Iceland is a fantastic place to visit. So it's a very beautiful country. There's almost no trees though, so it feels a little surreal as you look out and it's just mountains, but no trees. So it's very interesting. Very interesting. Good questions. Yes, sir. Um, so with the population being so much atheist, what is your plan of attacking getting going again? Are you like VBS or door to door? Or? Um, so the missionary over there, when I went to visit the first time, he took me out and he said, Brother, I need you to understand this. He says, I have knocked on 50,000 doors in the 20-something years that I've been here, and I've never had one person come to church from door knocking. Never had one person saved from door knocking. Um, he said, that doesn't mean I don't do it. It just means that it's not necessarily an effective thing. And so from watching him and watching his ministry, it seems like the most effective thing that's going to happen in order for us to get the gospel to these people is to build relationships with them. He has found success through a children's ministry over there that he, he does, and he has been able to get into the homes of many parents. And so he'll run a children's church, he'll run an international church, he'll run a uh, Icelandic adult service, he runs multiple services. The easiest one to fill is the children's service, but he uses that as a catalyst to get into homes and work with people. And so, from what I can tell by watching him, it just seems like it's going to be a lot of relationship building and, and 
convincing these people that there's something different about us and having them see it and then them realizing that they need it. It's an interesting place. Iceland, Iceland's considered to be the most peaceful country in the world. They are considered to be one of the happiest countries in the world according to the United Nations ranking system. Uh, they're in like the top four or five every year. Um, and yet, Iceland is the world's largest consumer of antidepressants per capita. They spend more on beer per capita than any other country in the world. I, I've got this, I've got a, an infographic thing that I'll use on my slideshow. And uh, it goes up slightly, 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 just barely. And then it hits Ireland at number two. And then Iceland jumps up way above Ireland. So it's, it's, they, they have some issues over there. They have the highest out of wedlock birth rate in the world per capita. And so what I see is there's these people who think they're doing great. They think they have everything the world has to offer. They live in this progressive socialist utopia, so to speak, without God anywhere. And they think that they are at peace, but it is obvious by the way they have to cling to these vices that they're not at peace on the inside. And we understand that because we know that according to the epistles of Paul, grace and peace always go together. And they don't have the grace of God in their lives. So the peace really isn't there either. Good question. Yes, ma'am? What is your abortion situation like? Um, Iceland was the first country to globally proclaim they have a zero Down syndrome population because of abortion. A deciding whether or not to abort a baby is on about the same level as choosing what pattern you want on your couch. That's, it's about the determining factor for them. They do not see it as life at all. It is, it's, they have a very, abortion isn't even an issue. Um, yeah, that's just where they're at. Now, just to be clear, Iceland is also the most pro, homosexual agenda country in the world. A very, very progressive country. Um, to be clear, my call of God is to not go over there and fix their morality. Okay, I am there to get them the gospel and the Holy Spirit is there to change the inner man. And I must rely on that. Does that mean I'm not going to stand up for right and truth? Of course not. I, I will stand up for right and truth, but I'm not going to go over there and preach at them against these things that haven't even entered their mind as wrong. I, my goal is to show them the truth of God. You know, their, their sin is their unbelief. And then as they recognize that, they'll begin to see the vastness and the damaging spread of the actual unbelief in their hearts. Um, so that is what our burden is. I mean, all these problems, they are the same problems that the United States would have if the United States did not have 500 years of Christian history. And the United States is chasing to attain those problems. They don't realize what they're chasing, but they're, they're pursuing it. Um, and they're just, that's just where Iceland is. That they're, but we want to take them the gospel. And the Bible says, the word of God is strong and powerful like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. And we expect his word to break the stony hearts and to uh, bring the light of the gospel to them. Fantastic. Where's your support level at? How long have you been on deputation? So um, we're at about 35% support. Um, I started deputation in 2019 in January. And then um, we had to pause deputation for a while. We came, we just restarted deputation back in um, this past January. I was on deputation for about a year before we had to stop and we got to about 30%. Um, so full story, basically at, if you don't mind. no, I don't mind at all. I, I try not to platform off no, of it, but no, I don't mind at all. I'd like the okay. That. So, um, God called us into missions, and about halfway through 2018, we surrendered to the call. We spent about six months preparing, organizing, and then we went full-time in 2019.
in 2019, um, we just started cruising. God was really blessing our deputation. We had almost an 80% take on rate from churches, which is a really high percentage and God was really blessing. That's not because of us, but I mean, God was blessing. The nation was in a financial place at the moment where they were just taking on missionaries and, and, and we were doing really well. Um, my youngest daughter, uh, Aylin, she was due, I don't remember her exact due date, but it was close to the beginning of September. So around August, we came back to Kentucky, you know, so that we could have the baby and begin uh, uh, just preparations there. We didn't want to be out on the road at that time. We had checkups during August. My wife went in for a checkup in, I don't know, about halfway through August. Uh, 14th, 18th, something like that. She went in for a checkup, and after the checkup, they came back, and they said, the baby's fine. They said, but um, you have breast cancer. So we, uh, that, that hit us like a rock, uh, right, uh, like a brick to the face. Um, so we had to figure out what the plan was. Um, Aylin was born the following week. And um, we decided, okay, we're going to continue deputation uh, as we can and treat this cancer to the best of our ability. The beginning of 2020, it was around January or February, we had to pull off deputation completely. We weren't able to uh, pursue deputation. We just really had to focus in on the cancer treatments. And so it, it wasn't, the timing wasn't terrible because there were people canceling meetings during 2020 anyway, but we just, we canceled everything and we focused on the cancer all throughout 2020. We were actually stuck down in Georgia during this time and cancer treatments in Georgia. Throughout that year, you know, we just, God just, he put a, uh, a shelter over us and it was uh, just a tremendous blessing. But he still allowed his um, will to go forward. And in January of 2021, he brought his will to the end and he, took uh, my wife home. And that just kind of, you know, it just <laughs> floored us. So I gathered my five children. Aylin was about a year and a half at this time. My oldest was about eight or nine. We went back to Kentucky and uh, we just kind of waited on the Lord. We didn't know what his plan was. I never felt like he changed the call on my life, though. I don't know if I was just grasping to hold on to whatever I could, but I, it never came in, it never crossed my mind that God wasn't going to send us to Iceland. So we just had to wait on the Lord at that time. It was about a year after uh, my wife died that uh, my mom reached out to me and she said, hey, Michael, I don't know when the right time is, but whenever the right time comes, she, he, she said, maybe consider this young lady. And she sends me some information on Rachel. So uh, I began praying about it and I went down to, for Thanksgiving to visit my mom because uh, she was going to Rachel's church at the time. And uh, I just observed Rachel during that week and then I approached her dad during that week and I said um I said um I was just uh I'm interested in uh uh dating your daughter uh how do you feel about that and he he said that would be fine so I waited about two or three more weeks and I randomly friended her on Facebook and then about a week and a half later I messaged her and said hey do you mind if I message you and she said sure and uh, so over the course of the next year we just began talking and messages turned into phone calls and phone calls turned into visits and and we just kept moving forward and then we were engaged and God allowed us to be married uh, last year on February 10th so we have been married for about a year I waited a year we worked at becoming a family for about a year and then we hit the deputation trail this past January so we're grateful to be, but we have started back. We are still at close to 30% support. Um, God allowed most all of the churches that 
had taken me on, most all of them kept supporting me during that time. Some of them dropped me and have picked me back up. Some of them dropped me and I think will pick me back up. I just need to give them an official phone call. Um, but we're, we're grateful for God putting us on the road again. And we're very thankful for that. Um, so concerning prayer requests, I would ask that you pray for our family. We are uh, a young family in the sense and we are still becoming a family and just learning each other's cultures and each other's uh, uh, who we are in a sense. I ask that you'd pray specifically for Rachel. She has taken on a lot more than is God's normal design but uh, I know that God's strength and power is fully capable of bringing grace to whatever he calls us to but Please do pray specifically for Rachel as she adjusts to this. She stepped into being a wife and a mother of five and a missionary kind of all at the same time. Uh, so a lot of prayers there would be appreciated. And then if you would pray for Iceland. As um, I have expressed, Iceland is not going to be an easy country uh, to reach. But that's where God's called us. And I believe very strongly that he has work that he wants to do in Iceland. Uh, and uh, so I would ask that you pray for the country of Iceland as well. All right, I have about 15 minutes. I have about a 40 minute message and I have about 15 minutes, but I'm gonna scoot through this quickly and hold on to it with me. And there's just a few th principles that I'd like to get across. I won't be able to develop them as much as I normally would like to but they are so crucial, and I think they are applicable for everyone. Matthew 28, verse 18, the Bible says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Obviously, we understand that this happens after the resurrection. Jesus has spent much time teaching the disciples about this time where he's going to be gone. He has taught them about the Holy Spirit coming. He has taught them about basically the church. They didn't understand it, but they had been taught. And then the Holy Spirit begins to bring these things back to their memory. And then he spends about 40 more days teaching disciples before he ascends into heaven. And the last thing he says to them before going to heaven is this right here. Basically, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Everything he had taught them led to this one command. This is the command for the church. It is the command for this church. It is your primary responsibility to preach the gospel to every creature throughout all the world. That is your job. You may be new to Christianity. I don't know where everyone is. You may be brand new to this, but I'm telling you, this is what it is. There's probably a lot of things you still need to figure out in your life about your life and about Christianity and about things like that. But the ultimate responsibility you have is to preach the gospel to every creature. That's what God has called you to do. That is the responsibility given to you collectively in here. You are responsible to reach the whole world. Now, this has always been God's mind. Before, the first thing that I would talk about is I talk about God's purpose. The Bible says in Psalm 46, verse 8, Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Verse 10, he says, Be still and know that I am God. That's what he wants. He wants all the world to know him. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. God's purpose is that all the world should know him. Think about the passages in scripture, Adam and Eve. God creates the whole world and then he creates Adam 
and he creates Eve. And at that moment, the entire earth knew God. And you know what he said? He said, it is very good. That's what he said. Obviously, man falls into sin and he plunges himself into darkness and things just for about 1500 years just collapse. And then God comes down to the, the earth again and he finds Noah and he delivers Noah from the flood and he destroys the earth and Noah and his family get off the ark and think about it. Once again, the entire earth knew God because that's his purpose. That's his design. That's what he wants and expects. You go forward again, and obviously the world very quickly again abandons God. The Tower of Babel is built. God scatters the nations and confounds the languages. And then he comes down and he finds Abraham, and he makes a promise to Abraham. In Genesis 12, 3, he says, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. Listen, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. God's purpose is that all the world should know him. Israel becomes a nation. They get sent down to Egypt. They're there for 400 years. God comes to deliver them. And God says to Pharaoh through Moses, he says, um, and in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up for to show in thee my power, God speaking to Pharaoh, he says, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. God's purpose is that all the world should know him. Again, Israel comes out of Egypt. He begins to establish them as God establishes them as a kingdom. David comes out against Goliath. He says to Goliath, he says, This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Solomon builds the temple. He builds it up and he prays and he dedicates the temple and he says to God, Hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for, that all people of the earth may know thy name to fear thee as do thy people Israel. God's purpose is that all the world should know him. Think about John 3.16. Jesus comes onto the scene and he says, For God so loved the world. So loved, meaning has always loved, which is why I'm here. From the beginning of time, God's purpose is that all the world should know him. And now that responsibility has been given to this church, that all the world can know him. Now we look first of all at God's purpose, but there's another thing that we always always see when watching God unfold this. We always see God's purpose, but then we always see God's power. God's power is over all the earth. The Bible says in Psalm 62, 11, God hath spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. Psalm 77, 14. God's power always backs up God's purpose. You look and you see Adam and you see Eve. By God's creation power, he accomplished his purpose. You go forward and you see Noah. And by God's destructive power, he accomplished his purpose. You go forward and you see Abraham. And God makes a promise to Abraham so that all families of the earth can be blessed. You go forward again and you see Israel in Egypt and the ten plagues, God's power to accomplish God's purpose every time. They come out, the kingdom is set up, and you see David against Goliath, God's power to accomplish God's purpose every time single time. You see Solomon, and listen to this prayer here. Solomon is praying as he dedicates the temple. Listen to what he says. He says, hear thou in heaven, and do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for, that all people of the earth may know thy name. God answers prayer to accomplish his purpose. God's power always backs up 
his purpose. Think about this. God sends his son, Jesus Christ, who is slaughtered by a sinful earth. He laid down his life to be slaughtered. And the resurrection power of God, so that you can know him, so that all the earth can know him. God's power always backs up his purpose, folks. If God has given you the commission to reach the whole world, he backs it up with his power. He promised he would. We find it in the text. All power is given unto me. Go ye therefore. God's power always backs up his purpose. You always see God's purpose. You always see God's power, but you know what else you always see? You always see God's people. But it's the characteristics of God's people that I want you to notice. God's people are always small and weak. Every single time. What part did Adam have in his own creation? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. But the power of God to accomplish the purpose of God. What power did Noah have to destroy the earth with a flood? None. But God's power to accomplish his purpose. The Bible speaks of Abraham, and the Bible says that Abraham's body was dead. But God's power to accomplish his purpose. You go forward and you see Israel in bondage, slaves in chains. You see Moses rejected by Egypt, rejected by Israel. Small and weak people through God's power accomplish God's purpose. You go forward, you see David, a young boy of 17 with no training and no armor and no experience out against Goliath, possibly the mightiest soldier in the whole world at the time, probably demon possessed, giant, and yet God's power to accomplish God's purpose. Listen to what Solomon says. Solomon says, hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for. Who were the strangers? The strangers were the people who lived in Israel who were not Jewish people. They had humbled themselves to follow the God of Israel, but they were not of the seed of Abraham, which means they did not get access to the promises given to the seed of Abraham. There are many places in, in the, the, the Old Testament you can find there were restrictions on them. They could not enter into the congregation. They were kind of outcast in spite of their humbling themselves before God. They were the small and weak people. And look what Solomon says. He says, God, answer not the prayers of himself, the king, not the prayers of the Levites and the priests, not even the prayers of the children of Israel, but answer the prayers of the strangers, the small and weak people, so that all the earth may know thy name to fear thee, as do thy people Israel the small and weak people. And then, if we're following our illustrations, that brings us to Jesus Christ. And this is a tough one. Because there's no way I'm going to tell you that Jesus was weak or small. Jesus was the Son of God. And from eternity past, He dwelt in perfect unity and harmony with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had no need, he had no want, he had no lack, he had no limit to his power, he had no limit to his wisdom, he had no need of anything. When God created the world, he did not need you. He did not want your fellowship because he lacked something. He was entirely and completely self-existent and had, had self-existent and had no need of anything, as was God the Holy Spirit and God the Son. They lived in perfect fellowship with need of nothing. That was God the Son. He is not weak. He is not small. 
but there's doctrine here to understand. Philippians chapter 2 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Here's what that means. The Son of God stepped away from his divine nature, his divine privilege, his divine authority. He stepped away from all of it. Don't misunderstand me. He did not cease to be God. He was still 100% God as he was on earth. But God the Son gave himself no access to his divine power. None. Jesus did not touch his divine power. Not one time. Now, that brings up another question. How can you say that he never touched his divine power if he did more miracles than any other human being ever? And he did. When Jesus Christ said, I'm the son of God, there was no doubt. Nobody could question it. Nobody had ever done the works that this man did. And he declared himself the son of God because that's exactly who he was. And you have to understand that the son of God became the son of man. He was made in all points like as we, yet without sin. Now listen, so then how did he do all of that work? The Bible says being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death from the moment he was born to the moment he died. He humbled himself and was obedient the whole time. God the Son, the Son of God, stepped away from his divine power to become a small and weak man. And then the Son of Man stepped away from his manpower to become absolutely powerless. And every work he did was in the power of God for the purpose of God. Just like we're supposed to do. We may be commissioned to reach 8 billion people and that commission may be given to a church that is small and weak in comparison. But the power of God backs it up, folks. And God works when we are small and weak. There's one more thing I'll draw out. God's purpose, God's power, God's people, God's plan. Always the same. Go to Hebrews 11. By faith, Abel. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Deborah and Barak and Samson and on and on and on and on again. Small and weak people, by faith, accessed the power of God to accomplish the purpose of God. I'll leave you with one more verse. Romans chapter 5. Think about this verse. It's an incredible, incredible promise. The Bible says, therefore, being justified. What's it mean to be justified? It means saved. I have been made at peace with God. I am just in the eyes of God. I have been cleaned. I'm forgiven. Therefore, being justified by faith. We all agree. Salvation is by faith. I believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ for the salvation of my souls. No work, no power of my part. All of God, my cleansing comes. We are justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2. By whom also, listen, we have access by faith into this grace. What is grace? Very simply put, grace 
is the power of God to accomplish the purpose of God. You were saved by grace because God wants you to be saved. God is not willing that any should perish. So his power saved you. And you accessed that by faith. And now that you are saved, you still access that grace wherein you stand by faith. You want to reach the world? You want to be obedient to the command that God has given? It's accomplished by the power of God when you are small and weak and you trust him by faith. And if I was to add the fifth point on here, this is all for God's praise. He is praised when his plan is followed. I don't know where you're at tonight. I don't know what hindrances you have. Maybe you don't allow yourself to become small enough and weak enough for God to use. That's a temptation for us. I don't want God to stretch me that much. That's asking too much. And God is trying to bring you to a place of smallness and weakness. Or maybe your challenge is, I, I just don't know if God can do that. Can, can God use this little church to reach 8 billion people? His power is sufficient. That's not where the lack is. The lack is always in us humbling ourselves and being obedient and trusting by faith. So ask yourself tonight, where in my life do I just not believe God? Or where in my life have I not allowed myself to be small and weak? Because being small and weak is uncomfortable. But when we are small and weak, when I am weak, then I am strong. Through the power of God, we can accomplish things. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the time you gave us. I pray, Lord, that you would just help me not to forget, Lord, so easy I depend on my own strength. But I pray, Lord, that you would help me not to do that, but to always trust you and stand confident in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor. Amen. Was that a blessing to you? Say amen. And uh, praise the Lord for that. And I was sitting there, and I, I, he closed it out exactly how I would have closed it out. It's, it's not the power problem. It's not the plan problem. It's not any of that. It's, it's obedience, isn't it? That's, that's where it comes down to. It's the obedience. And uh, us just obeying the Lord. I want to give a few prayer requests before we're closing tonight. I know they're already running the, uh, the van home with the kids. If you have a prayer request that needs to be handed in, Brother Peter's standing back there. Just hold that up. Brother Peter's going to grab them. Um, does anybody have one that needs to be handed in? All right. And uh, let me give a few here. And um, we have a few that were handed in this morning. Write this down if you would. Uh, this is from Linda Stowell. And uh, they are traveling to New York on Tuesday. And uh, Tuesday to Friday to be able to help uh, Victoria get moved in her new apartment. And to do pray, they're not only just traveling out there, but... Her and Brother Bill and Miss Linda and, and Victoria, they're going to be the ones moving stuff in. And uh, so please be praying uh, through all that for Linda Stoll. And then this is from Darlene Parker. She was in service this morning. And uh, keep praying for Brother Doug. He did. Um, he held his own glass and took a drink. That's a big deal. Uh, there was a, a, some shaking uh, with that. But uh, praying his kidneys will get to work. He's actually on dialysis three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, right now. And uh, kidneys need to start working more and to pray that the stomach will heal up. The original incision is not closed up and uh, healed up. They actually were scraping some of the dead flesh and out of it the, over the past couple days and uh, being able to help that. And so, But he is showing signs of improvement. And uh, so just keep praying uh, for Brother Doug. And then this is from Rita Glidden, and uh, continuing to pray for their son-in-law, uh, Dan and Linda. Of course, he's been on there, and uh, continuing to pray um, for dealing with cancer issues. And he's, he's struggling, been in and out of the ER uh, several times, 
And so just keep praying for Dan and Linda, uh, the son-in-law there, and asking the Lord to be able to help. So what we're going to do is uh, we are going to take up a, an offering to be able to help out the Shaver family. And, and uh, brother, I, I wasn't meaning, and I appreciate you you're going into the, the history, and I know that, that uh, it's not something that you, you say a whole lot about what took place, but um, I think it will help our church be able to pray more. Uh, for your family, and I wanted our ladies to be able to hear hear that, to be able to pray more specifically for Miss Rachel, if that's okay, Miss Rachel, and uh, to be able to pray more for you. And um, I, I will say I believe it would take a godly lady uh, to be able to step into that role and uh, search in the will of the Lord and knowing what God has and saying, God, this is your will. And uh, so I, I mentioned that we would have a Colton here tonight also, and he's sitting right back here. So Colton is right back there in the corner. They have a Colton. And so I told him that there would be another one. How old's your Colton? Eight years old. And so a little bit older than this Colton. And uh, so if you would be praying. Their table is set up out in the foyer. And uh, get their prayer cards and um, let's be praying. How many learned some things about Iceland tonight that you didn't know? And uh, how many before, and just be honest, because I'm going to put my hand up first, never really gave Iceland a thought for the gospel. I'm just, just being honest. It, it just wasn't crossing my mind a whole lot, brother. And uh, we had actually been in contact before. They had, they had contacted us and everything and then didn't hear much. And I had seen Brother Robbie, and Brother Robbie had given me an update and everything and so um, I'm thankful for it and so but brother Peter's gonna be back there with an offering plate let's uh, be a blessing to him we do have a hotel room for him tonight where are you heading to for Sunday okay so they're heading back towards the the DC area so they have a couple of days to be able to get down there so I told them there's a swimming pool at the hotel so they can take advantage of that let the kids relax and uh, and and have a time uh, together and so uh, we're thankful for um, all of that and all that the Lord's doing. We have another couple that's with us tonight, Brother uh, Luke and Vivian Magner. Do you all rem know, recognize that name at all? And uh, we support a missionary family going down to Mexico. And uh, so uh, this is, I'm not going to ask which one's the better brother. And so Vivian says that Luke is. Now that's a good answer from you. And so, Brother Luke, why don't you come on up here? He's getting ready to graduate from New England Baptist College on May the 13th. And uh, so getting ready to finish up. And uh, this is not the missionary going to Mexico. This is his brother, younger brother, right? Yes, sir. And uh, so they're searching the will of God. God's called them to missions. And uh, at some point in the near future, they'll be heading to Italy. And uh, so they're going to take some time to be able to prepare and be able to get ready for the field. And uh, so, Brother Luke, why don't you dismiss us in a word of prayer, if you would, uh, this evening. And uh, they're going to be driving back down to Connecticut, drove up here, be able to spend the service with us and be able to fellowship a little bit. And then they'll be heading back towards Connecticut uh, after the service. And so pray for them. But let's stand. We'll be dismissing a word of prayer. Take these prayer requests with you. Brother Peter has the offering plate. Let's make sure to take care of the Shaver family. Family, uh, this evening we'll get them a check and uh, we're thankful to be able to be a part of, of ministry there so brother Luke I'm glad you came up to Granite State and so pray for us tonight if you would dear Heavenly Father we thank you for this beautiful evening you've given to us to be able to gather together in your house and to hear from your word and from this missionary that you have called to send out to Iceland Lord we pray that you would bless him and his family help them as they raise their support and as they eventually go to the field learn the language and reach people for you, Lord. We thank you for the message that you've given to us and the encouragement to us and challenge. Pray that you would uh, help us with the rest of this evening and the rest of our week to be faithful to you. Lord, we pray that you would be with the prayer requests that were mentioned and the prayer request of this church. You know each and every one of them and the burdens on these people's heart, Lord. Pray that you would just be with them and the members of this church and strengthen them as they try to serve you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.